Hello, this is Dr. Katie Bailey, and today we're going to be talking about everyone's favorite odontogenic lesions on CT. Our objectives of this talk, to review the imaging characteristics of odontogenic lesions, and to discuss the differential diagnoses. So what defines an odontogenic lesion? Odontogenic lesions usually occur in relation to a tooth or a component of a tooth. These are usually seen above the level of the alveolar canal, whereas non-odontogenic lesions usually have no relation to a tooth or are just in proximity to multiple teeth and are below the level of the alveolar canal. So we're going to divide odontogenic lesions into their imaging appearance radiolucent lesions, including the cysts, the amyloblastoma, and ontogenic carcinoma or sarcoma, versus radiopaque lesions, the odontoma, cementoosseous dysplasia, cementoblastoma, and condensing osteitis. So this is not a complete list of all of the lesions. These are just some of the more common ones that you can see. So the first place to look when you see a sinus infection, especially when you're reading sinus CTs, always look for more. The teeth and infections related to the teeth are intimately related to the sinuses. So something that presents as dental caries, or in this case, an apical periodontitis, can erode through the alveolar bone and extend into the sinus, either direct extension of the pus into the sinus, or it could be irritation of the mucosa leading to a pacification of the sinus. So in patients with history of sinusitis, always check the teeth. Dental disease slash periodontal disease are very often related to sinusitis. So when you have this connection in the bone, this is called an oroantral fistula. So when I see these, I measure the uh, size of the fistula on all of the planes of imaging and describe which tooth it is related to. A radicular cyst is the most common odontogenic cyst. These are usually asymptomatic and less than one centimeter in size. This is an infection that spreads to the pulp of the tooth, which results in formation of a periapical granuloma and abscess. And this cavity, if it lasts long enough, can get epithelialized by odontogenic epithelium. So this is a cyst at the root of the tooth, and it usually has a thin sclerotic rim to help differentiate it from just that apical periodontitis, that infection. So what you're looking for is a well-defined cyst with a thin sclerotic rim around the root apex of a carious tooth. So look for dental decay, dental caries, and especially those upper lateral incisors. Residual cyst is an inflammatory cyst that presents at site of prior tooth, usually after extraction of the tooth. These are also usually asymptomatic. Uh, it's seen as a well-defined lesion, less than one centimeter in size, and it is also a well-defined cyst with a thin sclerotic rim. However, the overlying tooth is missing. So you look for that lucency with the thin rim of sclerosis at site of a prior tooth. A dentidrous cyst, mostly seen in young adults and adolescents, usually asymptomatic. This is a well-defined unilocular round to ovoid cyst with smooth margins. It surrounds the crown of an unerupted or impacted tooth, usually the third molar, and the roots of the tooth project out of the lesion. So here's an example of a dentidrous cyst. So an expansile, lucent lesion, smooth margins, scalloping of the bone around it. And here is the associated tooth, the molar tooth. Odontogenic keratocysts are most often seen in the second to fourth decades of life. They are also usually associated with unerupted or impacted teeth, but they do not have to be. Mostly seen in the posterior body and ramus of the mandible, and it can envelop the whole tooth within the cyst if it gets large enough. They present as unilocular or multilocular well-defined cysts with scalloped margins. In this case, you could see it pooching a lot out of the cortex of the mandible into the gingival soft tissues. Here's the adjacent tooth. It expands in an anteroposterior dimension as opposed to a transverse dimension. And if you do an MRI on these, these show restricted diffusion. So that's a characteristic that you can see on MRI. If you're doing a brain MRI and you scan low enough to be able to see the mandible, you can see restricted diffusion in these lesions that are intermediate to high on T1 because of the proteinaceous material. Um, they could be anywhere from low to high on T2, depending on the contents. But that restricted diffusion and the rim enhancement lets you know about the odontogenic keratocyst. 
An amyloblastoma is the most common odontogenic tumor. They are benign, but locally aggressive. Fourth to six decades of life, no gender or sex predilection. The typical location is the posterior mandible, so that posterior body and the ramus. These are unilocular or multilocular radiolucent lesions. There can be some internal septations. They disrupt the cortex and they can have soft tissue extension. And notice these look an awful lot like the odontogenic keratocysts. But this one you see there's no associated tooth. In this case, it is a lytic expansile lesion with scalloping of the bone with some cortical breakthrough, soft tissue component. Now for these sclerotic lesions. First is an odontoma or supernumerary teeth. These are hamartomas of mixed hard and soft dental tissues. You can have compound or complex odontomas. The compound ones have a tooth-like resemblance. Those tend to be in the anterior maxilla, whereas the complex odontomas are less differentiated. They're in the posterior mandible, so they won't necessarily look like teeth, although they might have tooth elements within them. So here's that sclerotic appearance. Here are some tooth pieces within this sclerotic lesion in the maxilla. They are also associated with uninterrupted uh, teeth or un in, uninterrupted tooth. And supernumerary teeth have the appearance of normal teeth, but hyperdontia. So you have a tooth that is more than you are supposed to have. So that would be a supernumerary tooth. Cemento-osseous dysplasia. The normal bone is replaced by a mixture of cementum, bone, and fibrous connective tissue. These are divided into subtypes, and they can be periapical, focal, or florid. Cemento-osseous dysplasia has a strong female predilection and a predisposition for women of African and East Asian descent. And like all of these, they tend to present in the fourth and fifth decades of life. They can be single or multiple densely sclerotic masses. They have well circumscribed sclerotic margins and abutting but are not continuous with the roots of one or more teeth. So these areas of sclerosis and then look for that radiolucent halo. So you have sclerosis centrally with that radiolucent halo. You can see it as well here. Cementoblastomas are cementum forming tissue in connection with a tooth root. They do have a predilection for the mandibular first molar. They can be locally destructive, but they present as well circumscribed radiopaque periapical masses fused to the tooth root, and they also have that lucent halo. So you see this area of sclerosis at the root of the tooth with a peripheral lucency. You can see a little bit on the axial, you see it better on the sagittals and coronals in this case. Last but not least, we have condensing osteitis. This is local reactive sclerosis resulting from chronic inflammation. So it can be ill-defined and it's abutting the root of a tooth and usually one that has some sort of periodontal disease associated with it. So you see this lucency, that periapical lucency, and then sclerosis in the adjacent bone. And that is purely from the chronic irritation slash inflammation because of the uh, chronic periodontal disease. These, this is most commonly seen with mandibular premolars and molars. All right, thank you for your attention. Just a little tour of odontogenic lesions that you may see on CT scan. Thank you.